now panel. And again, you know, again, keeping with all those themes that have run through IASA, you know, almost from its beginning. I remember th this morning, Naki said the early theme at IASA when he looked, you know, it was water, it was food, <laughs> it was land. So here we are. Here we are in this, with this panel where we're, the theme is ecosystems, land use, water, and food. And so I'll ask Linda Say to, to come up and she's our moderator for this panel and she will introduce the panel and the speakers. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so as Joanne mentioned, my name is Linda C. I work in the Ecosystem Services and Management Program. So for some of you, that was forestry a long time ago, but we changed maybe a decade ago uh, and, and broadened the whole uh, scope to, to all ecosystem services. Now, I was not a YSSP student, unlike pretty well everyone on this program, so I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a last minute uh, replacement for Dr. Florian Kraxner, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. But despite that fact, I can see that the YSSP program is incredibly rich. In fact, I could see it because I used to visit before I started working here, uh, and I used to visit in the summer, and I used to ask my colleagues, when is Asia Day? Because I want to make sure I come during Asia Day. But regardless of that, I have certainly enjoyed in the past supervising some of you, maybe teaching a few of you something about GIS, and I've certainly enjoyed a bit of dancing at the end of the year party with some of you. So I, it's been an, an incredibly rich experience. And so hence, it's my pleasure to moderate this panel. Uh, and I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Professor Adil Najam. He was a YSSP student in 1994. And you might have um, remembered that this morning, Naki said he was one of the serving members on the council. He is a professor of international relations and earth and environment at Boston University and he's also the Dean of the Frederick S. Party School of Global Studies. Thanks, Linda. Thanks, thanks very much. Uh, thank you to you, to Yasa, to Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Since we are the, our, our task is to keep people awake, I will have things move up and down the screen. Uh, <laughs> That, that works with students and, and might work here too. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 it's a great privilege always, always to be back at IASA. It's a special privilege to be back in this room, my third time, my favorite uh, room in, in, in this complex of wonderful rooms uh, that I get to speak here. My task today is really uh, to continue, uh, not complete, but continue the presentation that I started 23 years ago. Um, as a YSSP, I kid you not. Uh, some of you might have seen, a few of you might have seen some of the slides you will see, because you know the great minds are the ones who figure out what their real point is, and their slides keep changing, and the point doesn't. Um, my life is different. My slides remain the same, and the point keeps changing. <laughs> So I promise you, even if you've seen a few of these slides for the two or three people in the room who have, I promise you this is really the first time I'm trying to make this point. And I think it's an important point and it really is a continuation um, of the story that I started telling myself um, as a YSSP and I assume will continue telling myself um, as I go through my career. Um, I, I, want to, I want to raise three questions at the beginning and I promise not to answer any one of them. Uh, a, because they're really good questions, uh, and B, because then we'll have nothing to talk about. And the first of those is this really the question that, that I've been trying to figure out my whole uh, career, which is what does global mean? I think it's an important question because we use it all the time. We use it more and more at YASA. It's, 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 it's globalization, it's global climate change, it's global security, it is global food, it is akuna matada, everyone together. But what does it mean if in fact the term global is to be real? And that's a very pertinent question in this age and day when that question, that word itself is under assault. Um, at least in the country where I now reside, uh, the US. So what does global mean? I want to spend a few minutes on that. Um, the second is, what does it mean to live in what I'm calling the age of adaptation? And, and, and this is really a challenge to you, but much more to myself, because that's the point I want to make, that we are now living in the age of adaptation. That's not something in the future. And we are not very well equipped for that. 
is the argument that I'm going to make. And, and hopefully on that one, you'll be sleepy enough that you will excuse my impertinence. And finally, uh, this, this th last question, are we ready for the age of adaptation? As you might have guessed from the last point I made, uh, my answer is in the negative. So those are the three big questions that will sort of uh, contextualize uh, the next, next 10, 15 minutes. And I want to do this by telling you a story in three metaphors, five pictures, and six transitions waiting to happen. Uh, I'll do this very, very quickly by talking very fast. We South Asians can do that. Uh, <laughs> So that's the plan. Now that the plan is there, let me get on with the task. And the task really uh, to, to begin with is to, to seek your permission to allow me to be silly. Uh, I know professors can, allow, can, can be silly, and as a dean, I'll just give myself permission to be silly. Uh, so be silly along with me. Just play along this little game. Imagine for a moment that you are not in Luxembourg. Imagine for a moment you're not in Austria. Imagine for a moment you're not in Europe. Imagine for a moment you're not even on planet Earth. Imagine for a moment you're on some other planet. Choose your planet. There used to be nine, now they say there are eight. One of them is not doing very well. Right? And on that planet, you're looking down on this planet called Earth, and the World Bank or EASA of that planet has asked you to write in two pages or less a country report on the country called Earth. Okay, so someone is looking down at Earth, like we do these reports, and they have to write a two-page report, 12, ti 12 point times Roman, no footnotes. I actually give this as an assignment to my students. Uh, what would they say about the state of the country Earth? I'll go through this very quickly, but I hope you'll play along in your own head. Uh, first, very quickly you will come to the conclusion for the EASA of this planet, that this is a very poor country. This is a poor planet by every measure of the term. A billion people living on less than a dollar a day. Two billion people living on less than two and a half dollars a day. It used to be two dollars a day, but you know, the dollar ain't what it used to be. Uh, nor is the euro. Uh, but it's a poor planet with lots of poor people. You will come to that conclusion and the ASA there will tell you that. But that doesn't mean everyone is poor. You will come to the conclusion that the country called Earth is a poor country, but it's a very divided country. The 20% of its people control 80% of its resources. This is not rich country, poor country. This is rich people, poor people. Right? I, 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 I now live in Boston. I live in the first world part of Boston, two miles from where I work is the third world part of Boston. It's called Roxbury. Uh, in between, I'd gone back to my native Pakistan. I lived in Lahore. I lived in the first world part of Lahore. Two miles from where I worked was a place called Bhatta Chork, the third world part of Lahore. So this is not, not the simple, you know, rich country, poor country. This is rich people, poor people. You all know that. It is, it is the famous champagne glass, not the Austrian beer mug that you would want it to be. Uh, so, we live in a poor country, we live in a divided country, but we not only live in a poor and divided country, you will come to the conclusion that we live in an insecure country called Earth, insecure by every means, insecure not just because of needless war, insecure in food insecurity and water insecurity and climate insecurity and human insecurity, in every aspect of insecurity, you will say, okay, this is an insecure country that we live in. You will come to the conclusion that it is not only poor, divided, insecure, it is a degraded place planet. Its water is not worth drinking, its seas are rising, its forests are degraded, its land is denuded. All of the things that keep Yasa busy will lead you to the conclusion that this country is a poor, divided, insecure, and degraded planet. You would come to the conclusion that this is a poorly governed planet. If you ran any country the way we run the world, all countries are equal, five are more equal than others. Even my country, Pakistan, starts looking like a better governed country than the planet as a whole, and that's saying something, <laughs> right? That's saying something. So you would come to this conclusion, and you would really come to the conclusion that this is a poor, divided, insecure, degraded, poorly governed, and unsafe planet. I live in the United States, I carry a Pakistani passport, I know all about travel advisories. If the US State Department had a travel advisory on the planet Earth, 
it would actually be to catch the first rocket ship out of here. The problem only is we don't know where the rocket ship would go. Now, why am I doing this to this wonderful audience on this beautiful day, at the end of this day, to make a point about, about the age of adaptation that we live in? And the point is that our country, our planet, is a third world planet. And I think part of the problem, and ever since I was here as YSSP, I think the part of the problem is we try to keep imagining as if it was Austria. It's not. It's a third world planet if all the issues, inequalities, governance challenges that that word, which I usually don't like, means. And that brings me to what the age of adaptation on a third world planet looks like. And I want to tell this story, as I said, I, this particular, as a tragedy in five pictures. I'll go through this very quickly because this, this audience really knows each one of these pictures, but they're worth, worth putting in front of you again. A tragedy in, in five pictures. I, I've stopped updating this. They come up with this, 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 this. There are these five great failures of our generation, of our species. And the first and most obvious one to me of those is a failure of wisdom. This is one of my favorite graphs. Uh, this has been updated. You can look up the numbers, but you know, the, the point is there. Between 1991, 2012, 13,950 peer-reviewed scientific papers written on climate change, of which only 24 reject in any way the idea of global warming or climate change being a humanly induced concept. I served on three reports of, 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 of the IPCC. I resigned on the fourth one because I really think it stops making sense because more science will not solve the problem. Because the problem is not as if we don't have enough evidence. And throwing more evidence of the same variety over the same people who are going to deny it every time is not the only solution. I think that's very, very good work. But in some ways, we've created a little ecosystem of our own. Because we as a species may have evolved, but not to the levels of wisdom that I think we should have. The second failure that brought us to the age of adaptation, and by the way, I should say this, how many people here work on adaptation? Okay, I, I am sorry. I, I really am. I, I truly am. Because you, none of you was meant to work on adaptation. No, I, I say this seriously. We were not meant to work on adaptation. The idea was, the plan was, I was here in 1994, that we would lick the problem. This was a mitigation problem. It was a solvable problem. We would lick it and therefore adaptation would never need to happen. I kept myself away two different times from the adaptation reports because I did not think it was a good concept because we internalize it. So that's the age of adaptation and we are there. So the second failure is a negotiation failure. I was here in 1994. I had come from Rio where I had been part of my country's delegation. Well, my job was to bring coffee for the ambassador. I, I make good coffee. Uh, <laughs> and, and Berlin was about to happen. I remember going from here to Berlin. And no one knew Berlin was about to happen because it wasn't a big deal. No one thought it much would come of it. But to the, those who did think of it did not think in that in 2017, we would be first celebrating and then bemoaning what happened at Paris. Right? That's the failure of negotiation. This industry that came about of negotiators simply continuing to negotiate the same thing again and again. Right? And what I mean by bemoaning is we can talk about sort of my views on, on, on Paris and, 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 and that later in the Q&A if needed. The third failure, because I do need to rush through this, uh, that, that I want to point out is a failure of vulnerability. Of, of, of vulnerability failure in the sense that we, 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 we lost, lost the script on it. I'm sorry the words went. But you don't need to read the whole diagram. It's a very simple diagram. On, on, on your left, in the yellow, are countries which are most hurt uh, by climate change. And on the right are countries that most caused, contributed to climate change. Right? So it's, it's, a, it's a picture you've seen a thousand times. But it's a picture that we have ignored again and again because we didn't know what to do with it. And that, I believe, is a moral failure. And this is, I'm talking about my community. It's easy to dump on Trump, I will. But this, 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 I think, is our 
our, our failure as much as anyone else's. And if you look at the world's map, and this comes from all places by standard and poor, right, of who gets hurt in the adaptation age. Thank you very much. You will lick, lick uh, uh, mitigation with your electric car, sorry, Tony, uh, at some point. But, but tell that to the Bangladesh farmer because it may be a little too late for the guy in the Sundarbans who is already losing the shrimp, right? We did kick this ball, I did, right? I bought the hybrid, I didn't go to the electric and thought my job was done. And that's led us to this, this particular world. And this particular world, as I said, is the world of adaptation and what that means is adaptation is no longer something that you do tomorrow, it is something that people are doing today. Adaptation is a bad idea, right? Because adaptation is always cost. The weather goes wrong, you have to wear a sweater. And invariably that cost from that model failure that I pointed out earlier is borne by the poorest. Because that's how life is, right? Flood, earthquake, climate change. The poor is always going to be hurt first because they are poor and don't have the resources to do something about it. Others made this point earlier. And the failure of democracy, at least in some places, I don't think democracy has failed, but like all good ideas, sometimes, sometimes uh, lose a few screws, uh, comes at a time where I think it adds to this moment of worry about adaptation that I was talking about. So the point really is that adaptation is now, adaptation is about the poorest, adaptation is about development, and the future shock, and, and I, I, I will get some bricks and bats on this one. In some ways, it's not just the coal people who got hooked on carbon. We also got hooked on carbon, right? So I'm not suggesting the age of mitigation has ended, right? If you don't mitigate, you'll only have to adapt more and more and more and worse and worse and worse. So you have to live in both ages together. The less you mitigate, the more you'll have to adapt. But the issue is that we who study climate change also got, got hooked on carbon. Because our entire climate con conversation is fixated on carbon management as it should be in the age of mitigation. Mitigation is essentially carbon management. Carbon management is essentially energy. And that's how it should be. In the age of adaptation, that doesn't help you because adaptation is not about carbon. The adaptation is to the impacts of having carbon, right? So we need to retool and retrain ourselves to look at carbon, but also look beyond carbon. And part of that, the future shocks, is to start thinking about nature and conservation again. Right? The easy picture to put would be the panda floating, but the panda, not the panda, the polar bear. The polar bear is too cute, because I think when nature bites, uh, it, it can hurt. And what age of adaptation means, and I'll come to the humans later, is ecosystems start getting shock, and, 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 and that can bite back in many ways. It can bite back as dengue, it can bite back as vector disease, it can bite back as loss of habitat. Uh, I, I'm just coming from Geneva, where I serve on the Bo International Board of WWF, so I wanted to start with nature because I think in some ways those of us who study climate have kind of given short shrift to conservation and it's going to come back because its impacts uh, are, are, are really great. And it's more than the picture of the polar bear on the ice. The real place where adaptation is going to hit us, I think, uh, is hitting us, is water. So if you think about what to do about climate change, mitigation, it's all about carbon. If you think about the major impacts of climate change, it's somewhere else on the periodic table. It's mostly around H and O. So think of the major impacts of climate change. Most of them, current immediate ones, are about water. It's about water rising, sea level rise. It's about water disappearing, drought. It's about uh, water melting, glaciers. It's about water falling from the sky like no one's business, extreme events. So water becomes the currency of climate adaptation and climate impacts much earlier than many other things. I think nature does too, but we will be late in probably seeing that. Very quickly on this one, if I can take just, just a minute, you all know this, but part of it is the fresh water question, right? So that's the total amount of fresh water in the world. It covers three-fourths of the world's surface, 
but the amount of total fresh water is that just, that doesn't mean there's less, there's still plenty, but it has to be managed well. But the real issues I think are not just of fresh water and having, having bottles that you can buy with water. Uh, to give you an example, and people mentioned the Pakistan flood in 2010, there was a flood in Pakistan. So just look at the blue squiggly. That's the area impacted by the 2010 flood. To give you an idea of what that area is, the light and the dark blue, right? So that's the area impacted by the 2010 floods. The point I really want to make is that flood hasn't ended. Every year since 2010, there's been a flood. Last year, about 80 people died. Doesn't make news anymore because now that's a regular weather event. There's also been for every year since then a drought in Thar, Andras works in Thar, right? But if you want to see what that blue means, right? So that, that area, just look at the light and dark blue squiggly, which is the area covered by the flood. If I take that area, same scale, put it over a map of the US. That's an area from up in Vermont to down in Florida. That's how large that area is. Just to give you a sense, of a very densely populated place, what that means. If I take the same squiggly, put it over Japan, it covers the whole, whole country, right? Just in uh, space. If I put it over a map of Europe, it's from Denmark down to France, right? So, so that little news item that there was a flood, that's what it means in its human cost. So water, I think, is a key currency in the age of adaptation. I'll, I'll, I'm just wrapping up. Uh, the other key currency is, of course, food. Because in, in some ways, you know, food is nature's way of packaging water so that you can transport it and use it for other things. Too simple, I know. But, but as soon as you talk about water, you are now talking about food. You are not talking about livelihoods of farmers. Uh, this is not just about driver's less cars. This is about seedless farmers now, right? So in the age of adaptation, mobility becomes a question. And I agree totally with what was said, a great, great strides being done. But the adaptation problems are not just reducing the energy or the carbon on the cars, it's giving mobility to a very large numbers of people. The population people here know because part of the problem is figuring out what to do about those pictures. Because those pictures are not just about the world having too many people. Those pictures are about the world having too few people hogging up too much of the resources of mobility. And the others are going to ask for it, right? So the mobility question is not just the energy question. It actually is an infrastructure mobility question in the age of adaptation. In the age of adaptation, there is a housing, there is a infrastructure challenge. But it's not simply the challenge of getting five panes of window so that you can reduce your carbon footprint. Start thinking outside of the carbon footprint alone, which is very, very important. And now you have to house decently people who live in these circumstances, right? So the challenge is, what I'm saying is, the challenge is to return to the larger question that Yasa probably started with. Now, with a climate lens, that is more than just a carbon lens. And, and, and that's very important. My last slide of all, I think it's going to be sort of where it's going to catch attention always is with disasters. And I chose that picture for a reason, with many reasons. One, it comes from my country. Uh, B, it's very poignant. But C, it is about people moving. In an age when we worry a lot about immigration, whether it is Rwanda, whether it is Africa, whether it is Pakistan, whether it's Afghanistan, people move when struck by a disaster, whether human-induced or nature-induced or climate-induced. And that is a different ball game altogether, which in the current age raises a whole different set of questions. I apologize for giving you a, 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 a rather sad story here, but the idea is not really to give you a sad story. The idea is to give ourselves a challenge that is worth working for for the next 40 years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adil, for a very thought-provoking and entertaining talk. Okay, now we're going to focus on one of the things that Adil pointed out, which was water. And I would like to um, present uh, the next speaker, Professor Jungo Liu. 
He was a YSSP student in 2005, and he's currently a professor in the School of Environmental Science and Engineering, Southern University of Science and Technology, Shenzhen, Guangdong, China. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's very nice to, to uh, give a talk here. And I was a vice SP in 2000. Our proposal was accepted. So, and uh, after my uh, VSSP, I came to Yasa every year uh, two or three times. And in 2009, uh, my colleague, uh, Michael Wustainer, he asked me, well, we work very well together, and uh, we can give you a, a job offer. <laughs> so that's really very nice, but at that time, I'm planning to go back to China. There are two reasons. One is I'm from China. I'm really very happy to go back. Uh, this is the first reason. The second reason is I want to be a professor. And uh, in China, they give me a professor position. I want to supervise students. So I went back to China. And then Michael told me, well, why not come to Yasa as a part-time uh, research scholar? So uh, starting from then, I, I come to Yaf every, uh, once every year. So I'm very happy and I'm very lucky because I have never said goodbye to Yasa. <laughs> so today I would like to talk about water, the water scarcity and its mitigation in China. So uh, 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 we are living in a world with water scarcity, and this is a very big problem. And for all over the world, about one third of the population are suffering from water scarcity. But transfer project in the world. So this shows the, the, the irrigation area in China, and we have the largest irrigated area in China, and irrigation is very important because irrigated area accounted for about 40%, 45% of the arable land, but it produced 70% uh, of our green, 80% the environmental degradation, like in, in the North China plan, groundwater declined each year for about one meter, so this is really very bad. And for the dams, we have about 88,000 dams in China, accounting for about 50 200 kilometers, this is a lane that you can travel from Vienna to Beijing.
results. And here in this map, we studied the world scarcity for different provinces in China, 30 provinces in China, and in the regions. Uh, the, 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 the water redistribution through the water transfer project was about 26 billion cubic meter in China. This is about 5% of the Chinese water, water supply. And then we also quantify the so-called water water trade. Uh, whether water redistribution can mitigate water scarcity, we use those graphs. And in, in the graphs, if the, the dashed blue bars are above the green bars, this means the water redistribution can help to mitigate water scarcity. But if it's below the green bars, this means the water scarcity. But in uh, quite a lot of poor regions, like in, in Mongolia, in Xinjiang province, those regions, they have to export a lot of agricultural products. So uh, the water scarcity uh, be becomes more serious. So if we have a look at this, this is an uh, uh, example. the world, the water scarcity problem. And we found there is a transfer of problem from the upstream regions to the downstream regions because we have to build a lot of dams to So if such policies are implemented in the future, the agricultural water use will be reduced by 26%, and the industrial water use will be reduced by 80%. So this is really a very good way to mitigate the water scarcity, to improve the water use efficiency. And previously, or traditionally, not only in China, but also in many other countries, they built a lot of dams, infrastructures to, to mitigate the water scarcity. But we, we had a, a literature review. We found that if we can rely on the ecosystems, we use the, the green infrastructure.
all over the world. So to conclude my talk, the physical world transfer projects, they do not play a very important role in making may shift what problems for one region to another region, and what problems can't be solved by only using the GRI infrastructure. And we have to integrate GRI infrastructure with the green infrastructure uh, for securing our water uh, safety in the future. And the last slide, uh, the, the former President Kennedy has said, anybody who can solve the problems of water can, can, see, uh, can, can be worthy of two Nobel Prizes. One is for science and one is for peace. That's all for my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jungo, for, for showing us some very interesting research that you've been working on. Okay, our final speaker will now be shifting to forests and carbon in terms of adaptation. So I'd like to introduce Professor Pekka Kaupi. He was YSSP in 1981 and is currently Professor of Environmental Science and Policy at the University of Helsinki. Thank you so much and thank you for organizing this very nice event. Always good to be here. Uh, it's, it's late, so I suggest that we do some gymnastics first. I have a question for you. And you can answer by standing up if you are positive on the, on, the, on the answer. So the question is, from your kitchen window, can you see a tree? Those who can see a tree from your home kitchen window, please stand up. <laughs> okay, thank you. Those who don't have a window, no, don't need to do. Those who don't see a, a tree from the window, Please stand up. You have a future to come. Okay. Nevertheless, trees are many, fortunately. I fully agree with what Edil said. We have a problem. But we have many more trees than we have people. Do you know how many people, how many people we have? This we, this we perhaps know, 7.5 billion. Is that correct? How many trees? It was counted, it was a paper in not so long ago. Anybody recall the number? I, it, was, it was about 400 times the number of people, and these were sort of decent trees, a bit bigger ones. And so we still have a green planet. And my message here is that latest information, in fact, the blue planet is greening. So we have some very good news along with what we, what we realize, and I fully agree that yes, unfortunately, we'll have 40 more years to go with the, the problems that we are working with. So, so the, the, we have serious problems, but I, I'm going to give you some hope to, to the end of the day. This, this was uh, our, these are pictures of my 30, 36 years ago. Kaisergang was di divided in cubicles, and this was my best friend and colleague. Then we shared this. Today, I mean, we have wa we used to waste women's capacity in science, and that's certainly something uh, better today. Then, of course, the, what Yasa brought us. I don't know if if all of all of the YSSPS got the Nobel Prize. I, I, I sense that I think they. Fire, you had water, 
This is a picture that I stole the Portuguese uh, the situation. We are working on, and, I, and, and the fast, last five years have been really interesting. We have new data. What we are really seeing in many places a recovery of uh, ecosystems. Rewilding, as colleague Jesse Osuba likes to, likes to call it. So we have a recovery of forested lands, not every. with the technologies new new so we have lots of changes taking place but i mean this is not uh, we it's uncertain whether it's forest that always existed or whether it's forest that is actually recovering as it is in some many places uh, especially in the wealthier parts of the world so we are talking about this phenomenon that Colleague Ranga Maineni from your university is uh, studying global greening. We are seeing more and more greening, in literally. There's the ideological greening on top of that. And, at the, and then we have these popul uh, animal populations coming back. expanding forests, so we have, we have more of biodiversity in, in many parts of the world. Unfortunately, the best parts of the world are not seeing this, I mean, best in terms of biodiversity. And then we have clear observations. Uh, carbon sinks are, have improved. This is, comes from the IPCC statistics. Background. Thank you.
Please take a seat. Um, now, before we open it up, I'm going to start the discussion. So I think it's time to be silly again, because I really liked that, Adel, in your talk. Um, so I'm going to tell you, um, imagine, okay, that you have been made uh, president or you're head of the government of this country called Earth, okay? So you've, you've showed us that there are an awful lot of failures, and you painted a, a depressing picture. But now you can solve this problem. So what would you do in the next 10 years? What would you do as a roadmap or, or, or an agenda? Um, I, I'll call Pekka. Uh, <laughs> and and he, can, he can give us hope. Uh, but uh, see, seriously, I, I would do that, actually. Uh, so I have an exact similar slide, uh, which is the same planet looked at from a different lens. Uh, there are more more people who are educated. There are more women in the workplace. There are more food than we actually we, we can feed everyone. So, so you can give the same picture and write that same two pager, and say the things that improve. And I think where our our two messages, I think unite is I, I hear him saying and you saying that it can be a better world. Right? And 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 my my point is not that we are doomed. My point is that we have not risen to the aspiration and potential of our species. We were the first time in human history, first generation in human history that could have done away with, with hunger. We didn't. We were, we had every ability to have licked climate before adaptation even became a word. We chose not to do it. That was a choice. That didn't just happen on itself. And I think what your story says is that you can bend all of those curves in the, in, in the right direction. So I, I, I've always thought that it's a, it's a race between um, human knowledge and human wisdom. Uh, there is no doubt in my mind that we have the knowledge to lick these problems. I do worry whether we as a species have demonstrated the wisdom uh, to, to use that knowledge. Okay, thanks very much. Do you have a reply? Otherwise, I'll keep going. <laughs> I have a qu question. I haven't heard mentioned the Millennium Development Goals. How do you, how do you guys, how do you feel about those? I mean, as a, as a set of objectives and, and, and goals for all of us. Well, first of all, I think Millennium Development Goals uh, are very good because anyhow we have some some quantitative targets to to achieve, but uh, but I think there are two problems. The one thing is uh, I don't think we achieve those goals. If we look at the, the poor people or the people uh, with uh, uh, with food insecurity, uh, still the number is very high. So, uh, and um, for many, many countries, they haven't achieved the goals of the Millennium Development Goal. The second problem is for the Millennium Development Goal, we pay much attention to, to, to people, but we do not pay much attention to nature. So uh, that is a reason why for the sustainable development goals, there are a lot of quantitative goals for, for the nature conservation. So I think this is an improvement for, uh, for, for the development goals. If I can very briefly, not, not to disagree, but maybe, maybe to. Uh, so I, I kind of like both MDGs and SDGs in a general sense, but my charge has been, I've written about this, that again there is this lack of aspiration. Right? So really the best we can do is to halve the number of people who live on a dollar a day? I mean, for God's sake, that's the best we can do as a species in this day and age and with the wealth there is? That we're going to reduce only by half the people who sleep hungry tomorrow? Right? So in some ways, I think, especially with the MDGs, the trick was that you kind of made the goal what was going to happen anyhow, or you thought was. So you know, there's this movie that some of you might have seen on the waterfront, Marlon Brando. Uh, and, and I apologize, for those who, who haven't, please go and see it. There's this wonderful scene at the back, this is this boxer and he thinks his life has been wasted. And his brother says, you know, no, you've done okay, you made some money and whatever. And he replies, I could have been a contender. Right? I could have tried for something bigger. And I, that's, that, you know, 
my, my issue is this. I came here in 94, right literally from Rio. That, that's what changed me. I, I, as I said, I was there. I now realize I have students who weren't even born when Rio happened. That's a quarter century ago. And when I was at Rio, or the others who were at Rio, if you had asked them what the world would have been in 2017, I think they naively maybe assumed it would have been in a better place, which is not to say we haven't done anything. But I don't think we are contenders. Uh, the immensity of the potential this species has at this moment in life is not being used. That's, that's my contention. Okay, thanks very much. So can I pick you up on that point about aspiration? And can I ask Jungo a question? So you showed us about water scarcity, you showed us about gray infrastructure, and in fact, I read your science paper this morning, and I was quite inspired <laughs> by this fly. I was quite inspired by, by this, this green infrastructure. So it's been shown to be more cost effective, it has fewer negative environmental impacts, and yet we still see gray infrastructure everywhere. So, so why is that? And what, what do you think we can do to move away or to move towards more green infrastructure? And, and do you think IASA has a role to play in this? I think there are many reasons why many governments they pay more attention to the green infrastructure instead of the green infrastructure. The first thing uh, I think is related to policy because many policymakers they want to have some policies that can take effect in a few years. But for, for like for the green infrastructure, normally it will take a long time. Like for the forestry rehabilitation, it will take a, a decades to, to, to see the effects. So I think that is one reason why many governments they pay more attention to, to the green infrastructure. The second thing is related to science. Because when we worked on the paper, and we did a lot of literature review, uh, review, but we found there are no uh, systematic analysis for the cost-benefit analysis between the green and the green infrastructure. So in general, we do not know very well about the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, comparison between green and uh, green infrastructure. So they need much more research in this field. And the third thing I think is also related to, to the investment because uh, for, for many local government, they want the, the, the central government to invest in their own region. And this happens very often in many, many places. So if uh, normally for the green infrastructure, the projects are very big and uh, they need a lot of investment from the central government. So this is the, the motivation of the local government to, 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 to have a lot of green infrastructure uh, uh, projects. So I think those are the reasons why, why green infrastructure was very popular. But I, I, I also think, I also believe now, more and more people, including the policymakers, they, they start to realize the importance of nature. So like in China, there was a very big flood in 1998, and afterward the, the government tried to implement a lot of green infrastructure, like to replace the, the forest, uh, the, uh, the, the, the greens in the slopey area, the steepy area into forest. And after 20 years, uh, this is very helpful for, for, uh, for the soil, control, uh, soil, control, uh, soil erosion control and also for water conservation. So I think we may have a very good time to implement the, the green so, uh, infrastructure nowadays. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, before I open this up, I'm going to ask our three panelists, I just want you to tell us very, very quickly if you had to give one piece of advice to the current cohort of YSSPs, what would that be? One piece of advice. Can we start with you, Pekka? Be brave. <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult to see, uh, but I think uh, one, one sentence is to learn, collaborate. Be silly. <laughs> Set a goal that, that no one thinks is achievable and go out and try for it. Okay, wonderful.
Okay, I, I think we still have a bit of time for some questions from the floor. I'll, I'll watch for you, Joanne, when you do this. I will stop, okay? Okay, does anyone have any questions for our three panelists? Yes, back there. Hi, uh, Frank, uh, former YSSP, and um, I wanted to do thanks first to the presenters and um, a quick question to, uh, I hope I said correctly, Pro Professor Najam. Um, why do you uh, call it the age of adaptation? The reason why I'm asking is I worked in international development uh, for a while and we worked on mainstreaming adaptations into policies and practices. And the challenge we had is to bring in adaptation as a complementary measure to mitigation, which was well, much better anchored. We know very well now that we are in the age of the, or the Anthropocene, um, and we're changing global process, and we also need to adapt to the changes we are inducing ourselves in a way. So I like that formula, for example, we need to adapt to changes we no longer can avoid, and avoid changes we cannot adapt to. I think it was coined by Schellenhuber or others. Um, why not a more integrated approach? Why juxtaposing the two to each other? And another comment on aspir aspiration. I think the SDGs are actually great on aspiration, but there's very little talk, honest talk about the implementation and the trade-offs that are embedded in them. And we still work in structures that uh, put the different goals against each other rather than promoting synergies. Thank you. Yes. Just please go ahead. I, 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 don't, I don't really disagree, so my, my scope is maybe, maybe limited. I, I think it was mostly to wake you up, uh, <laughs> the audience, but, but mostly for the climate crowd. I think we are still talking in my community, the climate community, um, as mitigation being the overarching thing that once we have figured out, you know, the, I agree with the first two panels. Note that in my list, energy wasn't there. It actually was this morning I took this slide out because I agree with them. Uh, I, I think that story is written and it will still need a lot of work, but the trend is clear. What I think we haven't woken up, we meaning the climate people, is that this adaptation thing is not something in the future, it's happening now. And that urgency and that agency, right, with the Anthropocene, partly it's as if, you know, nature is doing something and then we will have to respond. Uh, no, partly we have done or failed to do something to which we are now forced to pay a price for, or some of us are. So, so I, I just want to bring that urgency, but on the larger point, I'm not uh, disagreeing. Very, very briefly, for ages, I, I think I said this, I, ages, I, uh, the first two IPCC reports, for example, I refused to be on the adaptation um, working group, essentially because I didn't like being talking about adaptation because I thought it would distract attention from the mitigation that was needed. Uh, but now it's become a reality and, and cannot be ignored. If you're a you know, fisherman in Bangladesh, that's the age you actually live in. And, and that's what you see. Okay, are there any other questions for our panelists? Hello, Shui Zhang from the Environment Research Center of Beijing, China. Uh, I try to frame my question adapted to, a, to three of you. So basically, first speaker, I like your presentation, but why you, in your final slides, you mention something that, yes, landscape is, is change always, so we, ad, we adapt to that. That's quite a fatalism in my point of view. And the, uh, on, 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 on a contrast, the Professor Liu emphasizes the role of the policy to change, change whatever that's gray or, or green infrastructure. That's to say people can work, people, people's, yeah, people's impact can change something. That's not, a, not only an adaptation yeah, 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 issue. Let's come to the final one. Just uh, I, I think your presentation is quite a philosoph philosophy relevant. So, uh, from your point of view, that uh, you mentioned many fillers. So, if we consider uh, the mitigation of, uh, of the climate change, do you think it's finally a filler or some some drama? Yeah. I, I really think that uh, landscapes change more dramatically than we realize and observe. Take the example of Chinese forests in the 
upstream the big rivers. And there was an intentional uh, mitigation, if you wish, program to very intensively plant new forests to control the floods. And, and there's, the forest is there now, and it's big. It's really big. And I would like to know what has happened there in Portugal, in that area where the, where, where the burns now uh, prevail. How, how did the landscape look like uh, 20 years ago, 40 years ago? Would it have burned that way, given, even given such a lighting? I, I wonder. So there are things are happening within a uh, time frame of uh, 10, 20 years, fairly quickly, over landscapes. And then the ecosystem services change. And we both regarding uh, adaptation and mitigation. So we, we really have to realize that it's a dynamic, uh, we have a dynamic world. And to, maybe once I have the microphone, the issue of water, which really, to me, was sort of surprising. You pointed out that this is the, if you think about adaptation, then it's about water. And that, I think, was both of you gave this message, was, was valuable to me. Would it be, I'm a mitigation man. Uh, I don't have too many years to go so in the, in the profession, so I cannot, I cannot you, you guys do, do the adaptation part. <laughs> but but would, it, would, it, would uh, fighting poverty, would that be the just thing to do regardless, whether you want to manage or, or adapt? Wouldn't that be a, at least something in common? Well, uh, should we you give a comment on my presentation or you ask a question? Just if not in the, in the two extreme sides, because you mentioned the role of the policy to achieve a better results. But uh, our first speaker, he, he mentioned landscape will change there. So maybe okay. we, we are quite uh, no, no, no impact, uh, no influence on, on that. Yeah. yeah, I think both are very important, particularly for China. Uh, policies are really very important because the Chinese man management is a kind of top-down way. So if the government have very good policies, those policies can be implemented very fast, like the forestry restoration. This is from the central government. So it depends on different political systems. But for China, and I, I think the top-down policies, particularly the environmental friendly uh, top-down policies are very important for us for a better future. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. It's, it's a great question, and, 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 and you know when someone says it's a great question, that means they have no idea how to answer it. Uh, so I won't. <laughs> but it is a great, great question. I, I, I do think I, I totally agree. I, I think the word I didn't use but hangs over everything I think and, and, and talk about is development. I, I think development is, has to come back. It shouldn't ever have gone out. I, I don't think it ever, ever went out entirely, but it is really the central point. And I think that's the fundamental discomfort some climate people have with adaptation. You know, after the two bears, the question really is, well, but you know that adaptation project, is it really climate? Because we are not fully trained to count climate as anything that doesn't count as carbon. Right? We, we have trained ourselves mostly to think about climate in carbon terms. Right? And I think there are people who, who try to expand that, but there is a generation of people who, you know, ca carbon management is climate management. And unfortunately, we are at a place where car climate management will have to be carbon management, yes, but also nature management uh, and, and other things. The, the other point I would say is, you might have noticed I repeatedly referred to us as a species. And this is not just a philosophical point, I think it's a very important point. In policy and in thinking about nature, if, if you think as a species you have a different respect for nature, and, and if you think of yourselves not as a species but a manager of species and natural areas, you undertake the project in a very different way. And, and those are choices. 
those are choices that we at this juncture in our species evolution can in fact make. Those are very heavy, if I dare say so, godly choices that we at this moment in our evolution are made responsible for. Okay, I think that's a very good note to end on because unfortunately all good things must come to an end. And uh, we'll be wrapping this up. So I, can we thank all our three speakers for a very interesting presentations and discussion.